But you know, if they're serious about this diversity and inclusion thing that is trending at the moment, you know, what impact can you make within your team, mm -hmm. within your environment? Welcome to We Are DeFree's Perspectives. We have a lot of responsibility. We reach thousands and millions of people through the projects that we're doing. We are a creative agency maximizing the positive impact on businesses, society, and our planet. So if you currently look at all communication marketing campaigns, it's not always representing society. Radical change needs to happen now. Otherwise, brands and companies are gonna get left behind. You know, if you're a marketing manager, if you're in a senior position, you're an opportunity maker. So how can you redistribute those opportunities in an interesting way? Every week, founder Mitchell talks to visionaries and change makers who are shaking up the status quo. We create content for every living soul on this planet. Get ready to be launched into a new perspective. The quick fire questions. Where do you get the most creative inspiration from? The wormhole of YouTube. Television or advertising? There's no difference. Work from home or the office? Neither. <laughs> Where would you work then? <laughs> Somebody else's office. <laughs> British or Dutch food? Uh, British food because it's not British. It's like from everywhere else. So. Pre-COVID or post-COVID? Post-COVID, 100 times. Yeah. It's going to be a bright, brave new world. This planet or the next? Next. Looking forward to seeing where we can not fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, can you give us a little bit background? I was born in Southampton in the UK, grew up in Cambridge, lived in London for like 11 years mm -hmm. and then came to Amsterdam about four years ago. I'm a British Sri Lankan and I guess I'm an entrepreneur. Nice. So what's your background story then? Start anyway, uh, I, will, I will ask questions so later on. <laughs> my parents moved from Colombo and Sri Lanka to the UK in the 70s. Mm -hmm. They met at Cambridge, both academics. My mum became a lawyer. My dad was a professor of engineering. So we grew up in like quite an academic household. And uh, yeah, it was like a really strange time growing up as a second generation immigrant in Britain. And then, you know, I ended up being like the first one in my family to go into like a non-science type yeah. background, which is... How did that go? Uh, I don't think my parents really accepted it until I went to like a good university. <laughs> All right. So what did you study? I studied history. So I always loved history. And I think that even like now in a lot of the docs and the work that I do, um, history is like a core element of that. Uh, I don't know why. I just, something I was really good at, but my dad really wanted me to go into engineering so always like tried to make me do maths. I had to do maths mm -hmm. all the way up to like A level in the UK, which was really hard for me. And I had to study, I didn't understand it very well. But history was always something that came very naturally. I always liked analyzing the past in a cool way. So yeah, it was wow. okay in the end. Is there, is there a part in history that's like, that, that impressed you the most or made, uh, made the most impact for you? Uh, that's a really hard question. I mean, I think the most influential thing naturally was the end of colonization in the 20th century, mainly within South Asia, which is where I kind of um, specialized. But in general, that whole period mm -hmm. when like new nations were born and quite interesting. But then I also like kind of like weird ancient civilizations and things like that. So, but it's been a while since I, a bit rusty. So, uh, <laughs> all this whole like media thing got in the way. So, but yeah. yeah. So, how did you end up? in a creative role like you are having now? Um, so after university, I got really into the history of cinema. Uh, I kind of managed to wangle my way into uh, a scripted uh, film company. So I was, it was the old head of BBC Films in the UK, a guy called David Thompson. He had a company called Origin. And so I got to kind of work as an intern doing script development. And yeah, that's how I kind of entered that, that wow. world. That's such yeah. a such a dream internship. <laughs> yeah. Or at least it sounds like it. It was apart from there was no money. <laughs> so like you have to somehow survive in In London. In London. One of the most expensive cities to yeah, live in. Yeah, really, really expensive. So it was it was really tough actually. And I had some money saved up, so it was okay. Um but yeah, the thing I actually got really frustrated after a while because uh feature film just takes so long to make. A lot of the things that were in development that I was working mm -hmm. on 
never happened. So I moved in from feature film into TV. I got another kind of entry level job at this place called Carnival. They did Downton Abbey and like period dramas. And I was just like, this is amazing, but also I can't relate to any of this stuff. It's like so proper, proper English, old school drama. And so eventually I had to end up, you know, moving back to Cambridge because it was like, I can't continue to work on such a low um, income. And then I applied for an internship at Channel 4, which is um, a UK broadcaster, um, pretty well known. And that was for me like my dream job because it was like, this is the channel that I've watched growing up. It's pretty diverse. I can really relate to it. Uh, And yeah, I managed to go through like loads of rounds of interviews to kind of get into a scheme there and then mm-hmm. uh, I just got really lucky after that yeah so, yeah. so what did you do at Channel 4 so I initially went into uh, the creative diversity team which was basically a team dedicated to making sure that all the programming was representative mm-hmm. but I never really wanted to be in that team so I would like meet the drama commissioners or the arts commissioners and be like can you look at my short film or like can I do something with you and then eventually the head of arts programming there uh, amazing woman called Tabitha Jackson, who's now um, who now runs Sundance Film Festival. Actually, um, she kind of wow. took me under her wing, and she started this strand called Random Acts, which is um, still runs today. Actually, but it was kind of for, for kind of short interventions in the TV schedule. They're like short films that came up at like 10 p.m. And uh, it was like introducing the internet into TV. I, I started out working in TV myself. And afterwards, I went into the drama and film uh, okay, yeah. world. I didn't last with them for much longer than just over a year, I think, yeah. because it was like too slow for me yeah. as well. Yeah. So I went back into the uh, TV world there. Yeah. Um, but I think a huge difference between the UK, the, the the TV scene in the UK and the Netherlands is that in the UK, they were already like, when you started out there, really focusing on uh, diversity and inclusion. Yeah. yeah. Where in the Netherlands, we yeah. still have a huge problem when it comes down yes. to the media and represent of the uh, less minor people yeah. or communities. Totally. I mean, like, the UK is a really weird place and uh, has got a lot of things wrong. But I think in the media sphere, especially the work that Channel 4 or BBC did, even before my generation, I think, and laid the seeds for, is, is actually really interesting and unique for Europe. So that was really... Again, you don't really realise if something's special when you're in it. But looking back, it was like... Mm-hmm. Especially being here, as you say, and you know, uh, getting to know the media scene here a bit more. Yeah, it was definitely ahead of its time. Uh, so, yeah, it was an amazing experience. What like happened I, after Channel 4? I thought it would be interesting to kind of go out of TV world. This was a time, I guess, 2013 when YouTube, I mean, it's impossible to imagine now, but it was still kind of in its infancy for kind of mm-hmm. art, culture and for brands. And also I was interested in the branded world. I'd, I'd looked at it from afar, but... Uh, you know, I didn't want to give up on, you know, storytelling, but I also wanted to explore other areas. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I kind of jumped ship and went there, and that was completely bonkers, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So where did you go after? After Days, I sold out a bit. I uh, got approached by Vice, uh, who owned ID. They just bought them, who were a kind of a rival mm-hmm. fashion magazine. They hired me to kind of run their YouTube channel. This is when I think the peak of Vice probably... 2014 time, 2014, 2015, when it was exploding. The London office was the head of, you know, European operations at the time. You know, and I'd travel all around Europe. I'd come to the Amsterdam office, Copenhagen office, to kind of manage different teams. So it was completely scaling up, but it was, um, yeah, different kind of pressure as well. It was really, really high pressure environment to get views on all of your content. So you moved to Amsterdam? I moved to Amsterdam. The pressure at Vice had got really high, mm-hmm. so I was burnt. I didn't know it at the time. Burnout is much more accepted here than I think it is in yeah. London because everyone's fucking burnt out yeah. <laughs> just by living there. Yeah, um, a normal work week. Yeah, it's I'd, like sixty to eighty hours at least. <laughs> yeah, plus the commute time yeah. and all that stuff. Like you're never off. Um, and my. My wife and I had just got married and we hadn't really seen each other that much because, you know, the work life was so intense. And I'd done one conference at IBC here Mm -hmm. um, and we came for a weekend and we're like, oh, this is really nice. It feels really international. Everyone speaks, 
you know, pretty good English, I mm -hmm. imagine it would be, it's, it seems quite, you know, global in its focus within the advertising industry. Can imagine maybe one day moving here and then, you know, randomly a recruiter got in touch about a job at a small agency here called We Are Pi, uh, who I hadn't heard of, to be honest, at the mm -hmm. time. But again, I kind of un I kind of realized that I needed to understand advertising a lot better. When you're going through publishers or, you know, as a, at a TV broadcaster, the conversation you're having with brands is through media agencies. What, what was your role at We Are Pi and, and what did you do there? And so I helped set up this entertainment division called Pi Studios for them. And you kind of brought in some of my editorial contacts. You know, I worked with some of the brands that they had and, you know, were able to do some really cool projects. Mm -hmm. So Heineken, Nike, Red Bull, some like pretty high level clients. And then we also made some great documentaries. Still did some stuff for Channel 4, but then also, yeah, um, yeah kind of did stuff for Boiler Room. So cool. it was a it was a really nice mix and a great bunch of people to kind of... I don't think it's your typical big network advertising no. agency. So it was it was cool, yeah, yeah. To, to work for them. Cool. And then? Then I got... This whole restless thing happened. <laughs> so the plan with Pi was like, you know, I'll do one year and then yeah so credit to them I stayed for three but then after <laughs> three it was like okay I really think I've maximized myself to this point mm -hmm. you know I looked at them as well as you know entrepreneurs and I was like oh what what do I what could yeah. I do in this space and I was like I don't know when you start a company <laughs> uh and at that point I was looking for a business partner looking all over and mm -hmm. it was really weird like you do go speed dating and you're like how can I trust someone with 50% yeah. of this thing. Mm -hmm. and uh, it's the hardest. I, it was really hard. And then, um, I'm sure you know this too, but then weirdly, my wife Lucy just said, well, right now, why don't we just try and do this together? Because, mm -hmm. and this often doesn't really get told, but Lucy has been a massive part throughout my career of my decision-making. Mm -hmm. Never gets recognized, of course, because, you know, it's behind the scenes. Yeah. But we, we really realized that at that point that, we kind of had been doing that, just hadn't been recognized. Mm -hmm. So we're like, okay, let, let's try, let's try doing this as a temporary thing, mm -hmm. and then we'll see where we go. And yeah, that's how the the story of Soursop kind of began. Let's speak about your latest documentary. Okay, so um, Kids of the Bims is a documentary about the mm -hmm. in Southeast Amsterdam, Salos. We did a cut. We premiered at ADE. It's so a really nice 10-minute film. Mm -hmm. And then I think we realized there was potentially a bigger story there. Obviously, there's as uh, far as Pete Neat's um, movement mm -hmm. was from there. And we realized yeah. maybe this story is a bit bigger than just music. There's yeah. obviously this history of racism and immigration. Yeah. And how do we tell that story in an interesting way? So kind of like it started to be a simple film. And, you know, this documentary is kind of blowing up. I'm not really sure mm -hmm. how long it will end up being, but I think it will go to festivals next year. When we look into the future for, for brands or uh, marketing managers, brand managers, what would be a tip for you? What could they do? I would say for themselves, uh, as opposed, look at themselves as individuals, not just for the companies they mm -hmm. represent. But, you know, if they're serious about this diversity and inclusion thing that is trending at the moment, you know, what impact can you make within your team? Mm -hmm within your environment, and then also within the stories and the projects that you work on. And we're all responsible for this, but it's like the little steps that we all make mm -hmm. and, you know, the chances and bets that we take and the opportunities we open ourselves up for can make huge difference in individual people's lives. So often we get caught up in like, what's the big campaign that we can do? What's going to be famous? What's going to win awards? Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're a marketing manager, if you're in a senior position, that's a you're an opportunity maker so you know how can you redistribute those opportunities mm -hmm. in an interesting way would be my tip what does the future look like what's your five-year plan mm -hmm. so i think uh in five years if we're still making stuff we want to and you know can get by that's mm -hmm. and we'll have enabled other people to kind of progress in their journey that's kind of you know where we want to be and uh that's the plan but i think in terms of the future we're trying to be more selective about um, the brand partners we work with and trying to invest as much in that editorial space as we can. Weirdly, when we do great, 
docs that it that gets the interest of different brands as well. Great way to end this. <laughs> okay. Rafi, thank you very Cheers, much for, yeah, for being on board. I really appreciate it. it. No problem. Take care. Cool. All the best. Cheers. Bye.